<laughs> hey. <laughs> Hey, thanks for joining me. Yeah, no problem, Jason. How you doing? Uh, I'm good. I'm I'm well. Um, I can you tell the viewers or listeners if they're just going to listen who you are and and what institution with you, you're with? Sure. You know, you know, my name is Ken Hickman. I'm presently the director of the Penn State All Sports Museum, you know, at University Park Campus you know, here in you know, snowy Central Pennsylvania. How long have you been there? It will be 15 years in about two weeks. Wow, 15 years. Yeah, time just kind of slides by if you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> and you were, you had traveled up for, I mean, that position or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, my, yeah, my, my, yeah, my wife and I are both alumni. So, you know, when the opportunity came along, you know, you know we were looking, uh, you, know, you know, we were looking to, to settle someplace you know, where we could you know, start a family. Um, it's someplace that was comfortable with good schools and you know kind of all the amenities that you're looking for. What uh what is the museum? I mean, what 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 are some of its primary uh, roles in the community or what you do? Yeah, it's saying our our primary mission is to you know, tell the stories and you know highlight the accomplishments of all of Penn State's you know, student athletes, you know, past and present. Yeah, it's you know we'll do that through you know, you know a lot of the traditional you know, approaches for, you know, whether it's exhibits, programming, you know, specialized tours, you know, community outreach, you know, it's um, because we're part of the athletic department, you know, and we also have, you know, a secondary function as, you know, as a recruiting tool for our varsity coaches, you know, some place that a coach can bring a prospective, a prospective student athlete, mm -hmm. you know, kind of talk about the history of their program, um, you know, you know, where the program's been, um, you know, talk about, you know, where they'd like to take it, you know, and, may, and maybe you can be on the wall someday, you know, kind of thing. And does it have a give them the full sales pitch. to it that you manage? Say again? Does, does the museum have a hall of fame component that you manage or? Uh, we do not at the present time. Okay. Um, there was a thought when the museum was founded in 2002 that that was kind of, uh, not in the Penn State team first spirit. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, that, you know, I think that perspective has changed. It is something you know, we're looking into. You know, we, you know, we've put together a full plan. You know, it just needs administrative approval at this point. You know, that, you know, that we could roll out, you know, Hall of Fame concept probably within three years, you know, if, if we were greenlit and funded to uh, do it. But you would, I mean, you'd have to manage the, the, the new space for that and everything right the outreach oh, and... yeah and it's and it's you know it's you know the obvious part you know is the space and the facility component but you know the what we found is really the trickiest piece and talking from other universities that have them it is really developing the back of house infrastructure in terms of you know, what is the criteria for inauguration what is the selection process um Who's going to vote? Actually, is there going to be a vote, or is it just going to be picked? Mm. You know, if there's a vote, who votes? Um, what do you do to make sure that you know, because we cover all sports, as most university ones do, you know, how do you make make sure that there's a balance so it's not you know at Penn State it's not all football, or at Indiana it's not all basketball. You, right. know, you want to make sure that there's a sport and a gender balance. As, as in terms of the classes that are coming in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there, uh, um, in, you see in other institutions where they'll have a hall of fame for their community of, you know, historical figures. And um, you got to be careful with that too. I mean, there's a lot of pros and, you know, it, you know, I would love to have that annual you know, inauguration event because, you know, it, it gives your organization you know, that one weekend a year that you know that you will be front and center. Yeah, you know, that, you know, you're putting the spotlight on, you know, on yourself. Um, that obviously is a great fundraising opportunity as well. You know, and there's all the PR and press leading up to that weekend, you know, to call attention into mm -hmm. the organization. But the back end is tricky because there, there's, a, you, you need to have those processes perfectly ironed out. Yeah, you know, or, what really should be a great goodwill opportunity, you know, can start making, 
get people annoyed very quickly about, you know, you know, why didn't I get in or why did so-and-so get in when I, I hit more home runs or scored more goals? And right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So you need to be able to say, here's the criteria. This is what we're going by. This is what the committee is looking at. You know, and, you know, I'm sorry, you know, we already had, you know, a, you know, a men's soccer player this year. And it was this guy who, if we look at the stuff, I mean, had better numbers than you, but like next year, like you could be next year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's and so much of it, like, so, you know, and this applies to so many, many other things. Is it's just like, it's being transparent and honest and making sure that that process is as clear cut you know, and that there's no shadowy corners where something weird could happen that you know it's just all above board right and people don't need to know who voted for them or who didn't vote for them but they need to understand what the process was and why it functions the way you know way it does yeah so rewinding a little bit how uh, how did you what what career paths did you take to to land there up at at penn state yeah um and, you know, I did the full-time graduate school path first, straight out of undergrad. You know, I came from Penn State, you know, straight to University of Delaware you know, for a master's in history and a certificate in museum studies. Um, had, had a great time with the museum program there. Um, so I you know, have some criticisms of, you know, of the certificate approach. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, just, you know, I never felt that it provided enough depth coming out. Uh, but, you know, I was fortunate enough that straight out of grad school, um, you know, I was able to get a curatorial, a, a, wow, a, a curatorial position at the American Merchant Marine Museum up at the Merchant Marine Academy in Long Island. Okay. Yeah, so I was able to go you know, straight from Newark with about, you know, maybe six weeks in between, you know, to starting, starting up there. Yeah, so I was, you know, looking at a collection that really had not been touched um, in eons. Yeah, you know, when I was, I don't know, I think I had just turned 24, like straight this out is of an, school. This is like an entry level curatorial position or? Well, I, mean, I was, I was the curator. I was responsible for all of the collections. You know, we okay. had a full-time staff of three. You know, and that was our director and myself you know, full-time administrative assistant, you know, then a part-time registrar you know, who was, you know, my age and he wasn't, you know, uh, you know it wasn't, you know, super experienced either, mm -hmm. you know, and a part-time membership person. Yeah, you know, so it was really incumbent, you know, on me, you know, to, to come in and you know, try to get, you know, some sort of intellectual control, um, you know, in place, you know, get some sort of you know, preservation process in place because it and the storage conditions were you know, not good I and mean, it was very much your everything was piled up in the basement yeah. type of situation yeah there were some water issues yeah like um, we had a flood while i was there you yeah, know that was all kinds of fun yeah oh my uh, goodness well for the for the for the lay person that might be listening my understanding is and can you expand on this intellectual control it pertains to all of that uh, documentation, provenance, deed of gifts, the, the paperwork involved with why we have something. And there's a thing called physical control collections too, which is, you know, all the physical, is it being preserved and stored in the right manner? Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, we, you know, you know I came in and you know, my registrar and I, we had, you know, we had minimal intellectual control. We had a composition book that was in like it was an acquisitions register um and you know we had to go from there yeah you know, kind of literally going through closets going through you know, <laughs> you know, rooms in the basement trying to just wrap our, our heads around you know what we had you know, well, and, and what was the main collection again what, oh, what was its its content i mean it was everything from um ship models and ship plans to um, ships, wheels, propellers, um, binnacles, um, all sorts of cruise line, shipping line, ephemera, you know, whether it's like menus, drink stirs. Oh. Um, 
from the area, flag, from the region, or? Um, well, you know, all American flag shipping companies. Okay. Um, you know, and you know, like one of the biggest collections we had was an archival collection that, when when United States lines folded in the in the nineteen eighties, the Academy received a phone call and said, "Send a bunch of trucks, and take whatever you want out of the building." Because it's just it's all getting liquidated, and the company is, you know, yeah. is done. You know, so I mean that included things not just from USL but from all their predecessors you know, back into the 19th century. And so we had, I mean, we had things as modern as you know, a full set of construction plans for SS United States, you know, from the 40s, back to boxes and boxes and boxes of handwritten passenger lists from Red Star, White Star, American Lines, uh, you know, all, you know, all the predecessor companies that it were ultimately funneled into becoming USL. Yeah, you know, so, I mean, I always got a kick going through this, this passenger list because I mean, that's, I mean, that's frontline primary immigration history right there. I mean, wow. Because I mean, you know, it's, they were the composition books that, you know, as you went on board, you know, okay. the officer would have kind of like you know, written your name down and you know, you know, first class, second class steerage, what, you know, what have you. And, and the date range was what? I mean, going oh, back I, to... Yeah, I mean, back, back into the 1880s. Wow. So it captured a lot of that uh, late 1800s, early 1900s yeah. immigration rush. And I think when we finally boxed that collection, it was something like five or 600 of the normal size document boxes. Wow. Again, the, what, the five inch width? You know, I wow. We had a mountain of these things in our, you know, you know, we were able to get a couple upstairs rooms to convert into better storage. I just remember having a mountain of these boxes on the floor as we were you know, getting ready to shelve them all. And oh, that's amazing. You know, and, you know, and our director's looking at me, she's like, you need how much money again to buy folders? <laughs> need special folders we we need special yes linda we need special folders <laughs> we need how many boxes so so from there you went on to to what where where did you go from there uh yeah it's i was at king's point for about a year you know, you know when i got a job as a curator at the uss constellation in baltimore which for those who don't know it's the tall ship right in the corner you know of the inner harbor there you know it's the okay. Last all sail warship built for the U.S. Navy, you know, entered service in you know, the 1850s. And I, you know, the big task there was, and we were literally trying to restore that ship back to its 1860s appearance. And it is you know, the last ship that, you know, that saw active service during the Civil War that is still afloat. Okay. I, Constitution was commissioned, was still in the Navy, but it was serving as a training ship. And Constellation was actually on patrol in the Mediterranean during the war. You know, and that, I mean, you know, the way, you know, I usually try to communicate like what dealing with a historic ship is like, it's like caring for a historic house, but just a lot more expensive. <laughs> it's you know, floating because, on something. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's a mobile historic house, but it's, like people joke about, you know, their boats being like you know, holes in the water that they throw money into. Well, just scale it up. So what, you know, what we were doing there was going through the interior of the ship, restoring one space at a time. Um, wow. You know, I was handling the history side. We had an extremely gifted uh, restoration crew that could do um, you know, could do the woodworking, could do, you know, fabricate anything we needed to have fabricated, you know, could replicate anything. You know, so, so, you, so sorry to cut you off, you would tease out of the documents and the history what was there and then pass that information on to the, to the crew? As long as I could find uh, construction drawings or something, we had the guys who could make it. Wow. 
you know, and you know, the first project we did there, my first year was we restored the ship's captain's cabin. You know, and we were fortunate to have had um, both the both the, you know the Navy's regulations for what a ship of that size should have in that space. You know, plus um, documentation from the two captains during the Civil War to give us a little bit more of a personalized feel of what they had brought with them. Hmm. Yeah, so we were able to take that space from really just being the original bulkheads that were in place but kind of beat up to using the Secretary of Interior's guidelines for uh, historic vessel preservation. You know, we were able to take that space back to what it would have looked like in the 1860s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I can still remember because I would have been, you know, probably. 25 or so, you know, the night we, we opened that, you know, sitting in that space thinking, wow, we just did something, you know, meaningful and important. Like, you know, if, if this is maintained, it should be like this forever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. We did that. Yeah. Historic <laughs> Ships, was that, was that a nonprofit group? Yeah, at the time, um, you know, it was just Constellation. You know, we, you know, we were the USS Constellation Museum, but you know, we were a subsidiary of another nonprofit in Baltimore City, uh, Living oh. Classrooms Foundation. Which um, foundation? I didn't hear you. Uh, you know, the the, the <clears throat> sorry, you know, the Living Classrooms Foundation. Okay. Um, you know, their focus was is I suppose um, doing a experiential education for at risk youth. Uh, you know, and they had picked up. Um, Constellation as a subsidiary, and at the time, what was then the Baltimore Maritime Museum, you know, which is the light ship, the Coast Guard cutter, uh, the, the submarine Taurus, and uh, a lighthouse. And you know, since since I moved on, they've all been, you know, condensed into historic ships. In okay, all right. Was that a financial, from what you can remember, a financial decision, or? Yeah, I, I think it was. Um, there had been. After I left, um, there had been some collective staff turnover in both institutions. And I think they figured out that it may be more economical to bring everything into one unit. And you know, rather than have rather than have two curators, you know, have one with an assistant. Um, yeah. You know, instead of you know, having development people at each site, you know, bring those together and so forth. Yeah. So you then you you're in a unique setting now because um, I guess you you don't really have a nonprofit board, correct? I mean, no, no. It's, uh, we operate with with an advisory board. You know that. You know I've I've tried you know, since I came in 2006 to build that group into as close to you know, a real board as we can. Okay. Um, you know, we run our meetings like we would, run, like you would run a nonprofit board meeting. Uh, you know, the one difference is they all understand that at the end of the day, you know, if the you know, we, if they make a decision and the athletic director says no, well, that's sure. <laughs> that's the final say. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, but it, you know, it's it's helped us you know to have that outside perspective and have some oversight. Yeah. How many how many people serve on that ad advisory board? Um, usually about sixteen. Okay. So now yeah, yeah, we try yeah we try to draw from both on campus and off, you know, and from you know, within and without you know the uh, department, you know, just to have a variety of perspectives. In there are a lot of university uh, affiliated or run museums in the country. I mean, there's gotta be thousands of them. I mean, and um, even though their subject matter might be a little bit different, you, you probably have some thoughts about the pros and cons of, of those, you know, what it's like to manage and, you know, that group. Yeah, it's, and one of the great advantages is, and you know, you're never, you're never, that concerned about you know, the you know, kind of the basic things. I mean, you know, the lights aren't going to go out. Yeah, you know, the plumbing's not going to explode. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of those 
kind of very base level elements, you know, are covered by the parent institution. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like in our case, you know, we're built into Beaver Stadium. You know, I, you know, I maintain a maintenance budget, but it's for little things, you know, like there's a problem with the toilet. Okay. Even then I can call, you know, I'll put a work order in to our office of physical plant. They will send a plumber to fix it. Um, you know, but you know, if there's a giant hole in the roof, you know, that falls under, you know, building maintenance you know, within the department. That's not my problem. You know, I will talk with our facilities office, you know, but they will eat the cost on that. They, you know, they will send the work guide to come fix it. Yeah. And, you know, it's, you know, you know, the, the bigger challenge, I mean, the challenges you tend to face in terms of, of, of the facilities are more and frequently, particularly with more mid and small size sites, um, you're often in space that was not designed for the purpose of being used. Okay, why so is that? Well, you know, in a lot of cases, it's you know, a department decided to start a museum. They had space in their building to do it. They're going to convert, say, I don't know, three classrooms to do it, and that's great, but if things like the HVAC are still the standard HVAC for the building. That were there yeah, originally and, for the classrooms. Right, yeah. right. And, and, you know, and, and frequently, you know, you know, there's not funding, you know, to put in a, a specialty system, you know, to provide, you know, it provides a perfect environment you know, where you might want. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times you'll see situations where you know, those types of organizations are started by you know, very well-intended, good-natured folks, but who don't have the expertise in the first place to know that we need to create, you know, you know the appropriate environment. You know, we need to have uh, the right kind of cases. We need to store the collection in the right kind of way. That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're very focused on the public-facing rather than you know, the infrastructure you know, that needs to be there. Um, you know, what we found, because it's in our space was built as museum space, but there was not, you know, that professional expertise, you know, on, you know, on or within the group when the project was moving forward. So, you know, we, we've had, you know, we've spent probably 10 years working with our physical plant folks to, you know, jury rig, manipulate, you know, and play with the HVA system because, or HVAC system, because it was not independent from our part, you know, from our quadrant of the building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's our galleries run off of the general HVAC, you know, and, and there was, I think my first or second year, we were having humidity fluctuations through the year. I mean, that were so bad, we had wallpaper coming off the wall. Wow. You know, like vinyl graphics that had been applied, all the seams were popped and, yeah, you know, it was sitting down with you know, the technicians and you know, saying like, what can we do to, you know, if the fluctuation is 75% now, you know, what are some easy things we can do to maybe get it to like 35%? Let's see if we can start by cutting it Sort of yeah. half and then go from there. Well, and times have, have um, you would think, uh, times have changed a lot. I mean, a lot of the places that were, you know, started up 20 plus years ago, like you were saying, there's nothing against the folks that, I mean, they had a lot of passion and it was great that they did what they did, but just wasn't part of the, the MO to right. make sure you had a museum consultant, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah, you know, so we saw we saw it to some degree in King's Point as well. Because you know, that museum was in a converted historic mansion. Okay. Yeah, you know, so you, you're we were operating with you know the building systems that were built into that house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so I mean, you know, the boiler in the basement was probably at least seventy, if not eighty years old. I mean, it was. I don't think it was original, but it wasn't far off. You know, mm -hmm. it, 
you know, I was like, well, this is an adaptive reuse of a historic property that will make it work. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we do. Huh. I, I, I think we, we've, we've joked before that it's part of working in, you know, in a smaller, mid-sized organization is finding ways to make good out of bad, you know, and, you know, find ways to use what you have to get where you need to be. Do you find that, uh, uh, maybe it depends on the initiative or program, but I would think maybe um, running things up the flagpole could go quicker or depends on the program, maybe it goes slower. I mean, what have you, you been your experience there with yeah, it, working it, with- Yeah, you know, it, it, it really, it depends on, I think the initiative and the audience that you're bringing, you know, you're bringing it to. Um, one of the downsides to being part of the bigger organization is, you know, it's you're part of a bigger organization, so you don't necessarily have the independence to be as agile as you might be as a private nonprofit. I mean, that's that's what you give up to have the security. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so it's, you know, in our case, you know, if we want to do a new program that is outside of our footprint, you know, within Stadium. Yeah, you know, that's a conversation with our facilities folks, you know, with our marketing and you know, marketing folks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to make sure you know, it's working with you know the other folks in the building to look at the building's calendar. You know, what else is, is going on in the building? Yeah. You know, is yeah. that being open to do what we want to do? That sort of thing. Um, sometimes that process can be very easy. You know, sometimes you really got to sell folks that on, on why, you know, it's, you know, in a way, you know, it's like almost doing like a corporate proposal of some sort of you know, sitting down with one of these administrators and saying, this is what we want to do. This is why it's a good thing yeah. for us. This is why it can benefit you. You know, and this is why we'd like you to say, hey, it's okay for you to go do this sort of thing. How does fundraising work in a, in a setting like that? You have to, I mean, um, creatively. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, you know, all of the museums, you know, you know on, on our campus at least, you know, for, you know, if you're going to look at traditional development, you know, or corporate, that sort of thing, um, you, you're going to have to work through your units development office. Right. Um, you know, it just, it needs to be funneled through that process. Um, yeah, John Deere might be sponsoring the next game, and you don't want to yeah. be going after them for some capital project or something. Well, and you know, the way some of the development works here as well is I may want, you know, you may be a wealthy alum. I may want to come to you with an idea. But if you graduated from the College of Liberal Arts, you may belong to them as a donor. So I would have to go to Liberal Arts's permission into their office and get permission to even talk to you, hmm. you know, because you know they have first dibs you know, since you're you know you're, you know, you're one of their alum. <laughs> um, you, know, th you know things like grants. Um, you know you need to work through the university's grant system. Yeah. You know, and it's just it's you know it's a couple layers of, of bureaucracy that need to be navigated. Yeah, you know, because you know the university needs to keep track of who's asking for money from who and when that way um, not so much in the museum world but you know it keeps um, the academic departments from you know hitting up say NIH or, or uh, NSF for lots and lots of money for very similar projects yeah when yeah. you know our sponsored programs office would have caught that before they went out and said hey you guys should probably get together and do a joint proposal yeah yeah, so we're not competing against ourselves. What other museums are on the on the in the campus system? Yeah, it's yeah, we have um, a pretty hefty list. Um, oh, it's you know the you know the big one. I think like at most campuses is you know is our art museum. You know, okay. The Palmer Museum of Art is the heavy hitter. Um, we're probably number two in terms of size. Okay. In, you know, in athletics, you know, then there's, I would say that, you know, there's, a, you know, a tier right below that, that is our earth and mineral sciences, you know, okay. museum. Um, 
you know, it's, you know, they, I don't want to say, I don't want to say they do natural history, but that's part of what they do. Um, you know, they really yeah. try to cover um, kind of the full breadth of what that college you know, offers. Um, we have a um, very, uh, very well, well known within its community uh, entomology museum. Yeah, so if, if there's, if, you know, if you ever want to see more bugs, bugs, oh yes, if you want to see more bugs than you ever care to, <laughs> yeah, they, they will hook you up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just like, you know, if, you know, you want like a bug show at your kid's next birthday party, and one of their outreach things is they will come bring like the hissing cockroaches and the different things, you know, do a kind of a hands-on thing for you. Um, yeah, yeah, and you know, we we have an agricultural museum you know, outside of town, you know, as well as a number of historic structures. I mean, it's it's really a surprisingly long list. Yeah. Uh, well, if there are students and professors, or maybe the professors that want to give students an experience working in museums or the public history arena, I imagine that's a that's probably a pro. I mean, getting the, that aligned is a little easier maybe it, it, it is um you know, we have for a number of years have had i think a very you know, strong and healthy relationship you know with our history department um you know they're they're the fellow who oversees their, in, their intern program at this point you know is is now a friend um yeah and it's you know he's provided you know a number of just really exceptional interns you know for us you know, through mm -hmm. the years um, and one of the interesting conversations you know, we've had is, and probably one of the downs, the flip side of, of, of the intern coin is I think there's a propensity for some folks to take the attitude of, well, if you're on a college campus, can't you get interns to do everything and save mm. a lot of money? Right. That's uh, not fair. Because <laughs> um, I think as we both know, you know, interns are not free. You know, at the very least, you know, if they're only doing it for credit, it still takes a great deal of your time to set up the projects and you know, supervise their work and so forth. And you want a meaningful project. Yes. And they want a meaningful project. Yes. Yeah. Like if there have been one or two projects we've done in the past where I had to create the project for them. They did a great job. They enjoyed it. But I'm like that. We really didn't necessarily need to have that done, but I wanted you to have something. And I feel bad that it was not, it didn't necessarily have the meat that it might have, you know, otherwise. And, yeah. But, you know, one of the interesting things that has come out of it is there's just a general lack of willingness on the part of students, you know, mm. to engage, you know, with, with internships. Um, you know, a conversation our coordinator and I had one day boiled down to, he's like, you know, out of all the hundreds of kids in our department, I feel like I have a group of like 15 or 20 that I would call professional interns. Hmm. Where every opportunity, they're on it. They're in his office. What can I go do? What can I go do? Yeah. And he's like, but with the rank and file, you know, the rank and file students, you know, getting them out and getting them engaged to come do these things is becoming increasingly a challenge. And you know, we were talking about different communication methods because he's like, I send the emails. I feel like the emails just mm -hmm. go right on by. And I'm like, well, you know, we have a new career services system and you know, we talked through what some of the options might be. Mm. But you know, it was a kind of a curiosity that at a point in time where those kind of experiences are probably more necessary than ever in terms of your resume. It's odd that it's it's been it's proven so difficult, you know, to get you know get numbers, you know, to yeah. turn out. Now that's a you know that's a big uh, talking point in in the museum community about paid versus unpaid internships yeah. and the con some of the controversy involved with with not paying interns and. Of course, in the university setting, imagine um, it, it's it's more of a possibility to give them something. Is that true or not true? Or um, it, it it really it really depends on on what the budget situation is. You mm -hmm. know, we have you know a, a budget for wage payroll. You know, that covers our part time staff. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, so yeah, we can always dip into that. And you know, I'm at a point now where that's healthy enough that I like to try to budget, you know, for that opportunity. That's good. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we've been as guilty as a lot of places in the past where it's simply been academic credit. Um, and I, I will admit, I if it's during the school year, I, you know, I didn't necessarily feel as bad about that because it was just, in a lot of ways, this was one more class that they were mm -hmm. taking. Sure. And it, their food, their housing, everything was just part of their, their normal college experience. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't like me coming to you when you were in Carlisle, having to find a place to stay. Yeah, over you know, the summer or something. Um, yeah, but, yeah, but you know, if, you know, if it's in the summer, I, well, moving forward, I would like to make sure that we're paying something. Yeah. You know, you know year round. But, you know, I, I would think, you know, in the past that if it was in the summer, you know, you know, we, were you know we were making provision, you know, for that, where we could carry them as wage payroll you know, you know, like any of our gallery staff, you know, yeah. except they're doing this other thing. Right. How many staff do you have at, at the museum? Uh, it's, it were three full time, one three quarter time. Um, then usually between 12 and 15 part time. Okay. You know, it just, it just depends on the time of year. Seasonally. You know, yeah. We'll staff up kind of April through the fall, then fade back a little bit late fall through the winter. Does it depend on the sports season and people visiting and that sort of thing? Yeah, it's, we found years and years ago that you know, the, you know, the, that the visitation January to mid-March, midweek was, well, really non-existent. Mm. So we run on a shortened schedule you know, for, for those, I don't know, about 10 weeks. Okay. Um, yeah, so where it's just Friday, Saturday, Sunday. All right. Yeah, yeah so we just don't necessarily have, have the hours to give. You know, and, and, and programming will ramp up kind of from the beginning of May through the end of the football season in November. Mm -hmm. You know, then it, it will ebb back into that kind of winter mode. Hmm. Do you have students that go on to to uh, persevere and work work in the museum field? Yeah, it's you know it's a it's a conversation I've had with a number of kids through the years. Um, it usually becomes a series of conversations um, because you know it's you know, you know I I want them to understand what they're getting into. You know. Um, you know, I want to provide the guidance that I didn't necessarily get, and I'm not regretting anything. I just, yeah, you know, there wasn't necessarily you know, folks along the way back in the '90s mm -hmm. to help you know, show you what the right, you know, what the different paths could be. Um, you know, we've had a couple who you know, have gone that route, um, and. I think, in all honesty, I think only one is working in the field at the moment. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's you know, you, know, the, you know the conversation that I'll usually have with them is first off is Are you sure? Are you really sure? Okay. <laughs> you know, and it's, I, you know, you can do grad school now. You can do grad school later, but you're going to yeah. have to do grad school. Yeah. You know, and your two roads really are, um, you can get that museum studies masters, or you can go to a program like Delaware, where it's, you know, a certificate, you know, it's something on the side. Mm -hmm. And the upside with the master's program, the straight up master's program is, you know, they will teach you a little bit of everything. You know, you think, you know, I've always argued, you should be able to come out of one of those programs being able to do basic collections care, write a program, write a grant, do some basic administration and some basic marketing. Mm -hmm. um, I'd argue that you know you should put accounting in too, but that always makes people twitchy. <laughs> <laughs> but the trick with that degree is, and that's a pretty single lane degree. You know, it's that's the road you're on, and 
the upside to someplace you know, like Delaware is your master's is going to be in a discipline rather than museum studies. And that was something our program head, Bryant Tolls, way back when was very adamant about. And like I think about the people we had in our in our class, you know, classes, and it was a lot of history folks, a lot of art history, but you know, there was a couple from geology, a couple MBAs. Um, hmm. It was certainly a little more diverse in terms of the academic background. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but you know, the argument was that, like in our case, well, if you don't want to work in a museum, you know, you have a history degree, you, know, you can go be an editor or go, you know, go take your teaching exams, that sort of thing. You know, you're not going to be locked into you know, the museum world. Mm. And the downside is, you know, I've taken any number of marketing, accounting, you know, I started an MBA at one point, you know, that I dropped when we moved up here, just to try to fill in some of the administrative, um, and, you know, some you know, administrative things that we didn't get sure. you know, at, at UD. And, um, yeah. So, you know, that's usually the first choice, you know, and, you know, depending on how committed they are, you know, let them go from there. It, yeah. Well, before we wrap up, for all those Penn State lovers out there, can you, uh, sports lovers especially, what can you um, share maybe, I don't know, top one to three really cool objects that you have in the museum there? Uh, um, the, one of the ones that if we were ever to apply to um, like mysteries at the museum. Okay is in the collection, our, our first African-American uh, letter winner, Wally Triplett, who played back in the late 40s, um, became the first African-American player who, was, who was, was both drafted and played in the, in, the, in the NFL. I have his set of contact lenses from his rookie year. Wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and as I sit here wearing my contacts, I will tell you that there's no planet that I want to put those contacts in my eyes. And they look like someone took. For football? He put, put yeah. them in for football. Yeah. They look like someone took a clear ping pong ball and cut it in half. Oh, my word. I mean, they, and they are substantial. From what date? Around what time period again? That well, should have been early 50s. Wow. So they're not like the little like uh, things you yep. buy nowadays yep. that you can hardly notice that they're in your eye. Yeah, these are not the ones you'd want to put in on the first of the month and take out on the thirtieth. <laughs> wow. And I don't know that I want to put them in at all, but you know he didn't want to play with glasses, so that this was the option. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the one the fans all like is we have John Capaletti's Heisman Trophy, you know, from nineteen seventy three. Um, the one we have on display is a real Heisman. It is from 1973. Hmm. Um, it is not the one that Coach Paterno brought back from New York that night. You know, I have that under glass down at our football building. Okay. Um, the one we have in the gallery is out. You can touch it. Like the head is all shiny now because people rub it. <laughs> um, but yeah, the university, you know, in a bit of foresight, bought a spare. Oh, okay. You know, back in 73. So we have the spare out almost in a sacrificial way at this point that you can, you know, touch, interact with, you know, everyone takes their picture doing the pose behind it. Yeah. Yeah, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. I mean, Neat. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, and, you know, I think beyond that, you know, we have, you know, one thing we've really tried to do in recent years is, use sports as, as a lens for looking at bigger issues. Okay, and, yeah. But you, you can only talk about, you know, we won this game blank to blank so often, and it's just, yeah, like, that's great. I mean, that's wonderful. But, you know, we have almost 150 years of student athletes have gone on to do all sorts of interesting things. Yeah. Um, and the department has been involved in all sorts of interesting things. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, 
That's cool. Yeah, like one, you know, one collection that just came in around a World War II project we're doing, you know, is a whole set of letters from one of our basketball players, you know, who was shot down over Austria in February 1945. And they're wow. all his, it's his letters home to his wife, as well as all of the letters, because he was the, um, he was the pilot and the commander on the aircraft. His wife, because of his role on the aircraft, had to coordinate communicating with the other nine families of the crewmen on board. Hmm. So we have all the letters among the but families. You, said. you know, and you know, it's some of them are incredibly heartbreaking because two of the ten guys did you know, did not survive, you know, hmm. getting out of the aircraft. Wow. And you read these letters of, you know, I think one is a wife and the other is a mother. You know, writing to our fellow's wife saying, you know, we can't get any information about our loved one, you know, from the army. You know, have you heard anything? Can you write to Jack and ask and find out, you know, did they get out? Mm. You know, sitting here in, in 2021, you know they didn't, but, you know, you're kind of reading this in real time. You know? Yeah. And it, wow. It's powerful stuff. Yeah. Wow. But, you well, know, it's, it's one of the ways that we can use yeah, we're using basketball to look at, you know, something that happened in Europe 80 years ago. Yeah. So. Well, thank you for sharing those um, those vignettes. I Before we close, I have um, a lightning round, three questions, and you give an answer. <laughs> um, and you can elaborate or not as much as you want. Um, so the first question is, uh, the Shining or Freddy Krueger? Oh, Shining. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, huh? <laughs> I thought, man. Uh, and the Shining with, you know, a diagonal line to the Simpsons doing the Shining. That's still, <laughs> I think, the best Halloween one they've ever done. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I've got a, a steak or a crab cake. Oh, crab cake. That's easy. Was that because your time down south? Now, it's the time in Baltimore and all the summers I spent crabbing with my grandfather, you know, in, in Cape May. And that's, yeah, that's easy. And I've Neat. been, I've been picking crabs since I was like three. Neat. And then, uh, okay. Uh, kayaking or running? Oof. Yeah, that's have tougher. to pick wow. one. <laughs> Thanks. Cause I, I do both a lot. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm going to take my kayak only because there are a few things more relaxing than just, you know, you know floating down, yeah. you know, floating down the lake or floating down the stream. Well, I heard, and I knew you were a big uh, runner. Yeah. You still uh, run a lot now? Oh, yeah. It, I'm finding now that you know, as we get older, the, the running, running and trying to ski as much as I have, it's not working out so well. So I'm on, <laughs> I'm on a little bit of a running sabbatical here until the snow melts. <laughs> Ken Hickman, I, uh, I really appre appreciate the time that you took out of your day today. Oh, no problem, Jason. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think people will enjoy hearing about, you know, the unique setting that you work in. And um, and I think the stuff that you got into about working with the students, that's really helpful, too, for students to, to hear about that well, stuff, too. Yeah, you know, it's I've always tried to take the attitude of you know, there were a lot of people you know, who you know, went out of their way as I was coming through to help out. And it's yeah. just. I've always viewed it as kind of a pay it forward yep. sort of thing. And it's we have career services and things now you know, that we didn't have 25 years ago that, you know, it's like if they called and asked, you know, can you come do whatever? Like, yeah, let's, yeah. You know, let's, let's give these kids as much information and opportunity as we can. And the job yeah. market wasn't easy for us coming out and it certainly isn't any better now. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you have a, a good rest of your afternoon, and I'm going to stop the recording. All right. Sounds good, buddy. All right, Ken. All right. Thank you, Jay. Yep.